Today we're going to introduce you to The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne is the author of our story, and Hawthorne once said, I do not want to be a doctor and live by man's diseases, nor a minister to live by their sins, nor a lawyer and live by their quarrels. So I don't see that there's anything left for me to be but an author. So after graduating from college, Hawthorne found a job at the Custom House, which is a building where people monitored and documented goods for import and export in Salem, Massachusetts. Now, he was fired from this position in 1849, and at that point, now we had to go full-time as a writer, and he decided to write THE Great American Novel. And so now we have the story of the beautiful heart-wrenching tale of Hester Prynne. So let's take a look at the setting in historical context, context of The Scarlet Letter. So we don't know the exact date, but we're probably somewhere around the 1650s or the mid-17th century uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, known as the New England Colonies. We're certainly well before America when, when it was uh, created. We're certainly even well before, like, say, those Salem witch trials or the actual setup of big towns. We are a very small settlement. The society is governed by Puritans, which are a deeply religious time. It's a theocracy. So you do have a governor who's been elected and sent over by the King of England. But everybody else who's eventually in charge, they're all going to be the religious elders. So let's take a look more at the Puritans. These are religious men and women who settled at Plymouth Rock and they founded the town of Boston. They left the Church of England at the time. They did not want to be under the king's direct rule for their, for their worshipping. They sought a purer form of religion, and they would inflict public punishments to deter others from straying from their particular religious sect, such as you would even have death. They would hang people. So now when we take a look at the Scarlet Letter, as Nathaniel Hawthorne wants to kind of get us into the Puritan feel, there will be times where he does discuss uh, from their point of view. For example, one of the quotes we have at the bottom is, to be true, be true, be true. Show freely to the world, if not your worst, yet some trait whereby the worst may be inferred. Kind of gives you an idea of what he thought about Puritan times and their rule. There are quite a few themes you could be looking out for in the story. Um, I would highly suggest not to look for all of them at once. It would be pretty difficult to do. But the first few, the first three or four, are definitely going to be ones that are used over and over again. You'll find lots of examples for them. Such as the tie-in to the idea of revenge. You're going to realize that there is a major character that is seeking revenge. Women and femininity. This was written in the 1850s about a woman in the 1650s, and she is the major character. We're going to follow along with Hester Prynne throughout in her entire story and how everything else focuses around her. We even have another somewhat major character in Pearl, her daughter. The idea of compassion and forgiveness and a little bit more the idea of sin, um, the idea of the Scarlet Letter being a mark of a sin, um, that we have then this idea or this sense of, can we be compassionate? Can we forgive sins? Those kind of tie together. But I would say maybe looking at those first three or four, those are the biggest themes you're going to see. There are other themes that you might be able to find as well, such as the sense of, uh, sense of hypocrisy, where we have upright standing religious elders who have to enforce laws and punishments, and maybe perhaps they themselves have done some of the crimes. The sense of guilt and blame, where we might be looking at, is there peop are there people who might have a sense of guilt because of something they've done wrong, or maybe perhaps are they blaming somebody for their own crimes and sins? We're also looking at the sense of judgment, where we are, are we are ourselves right to lay blame and have people judged. We're looking at that sense of isolation as well. This is the 1650s in America. We do have this sense of not being able to leave the settlement, to be able to find other help from the settlement. There is a very strict control, and if you are not part of the control, you're going to have almost no way to get out from underneath the rule. There's also going to be a sense of 
uh, the sense of supernatural or the sense of fate as well. When we're looking at a very religious sect of people and we're in an isolated wilderness where we might be surrounded by other people who don't believe our religious faith. And so you're going to have people believing in superstitions. You're going to have people who are believing that there is a set fate already, that if you've done something wrong, there's no way you can correct it. And then the man in the natural world. A lot of your theme will also tie to the motifs of nature in this book. So our characters that we'll be following along with, there are certainly several characters in the book, but the ones who are going to be changing, whether they're changing the characters themselves or changing the plotline themselves, are listed here. For example, Hester Prynne is your main character. She is the wearer of the Scarlet Letter. Hester has a child by the name of Pearl. She is the living symbol of Hester's sin. At least that's the way people see her in the town. Her husband changes his name so nobody ties him to her, and he goes by the name of Roger Chillingworth. Now, he was a scholar over in Europe, so he knows enough to be able in this small wilderness town to become the doctor. Arthur Dimsdale is an admired young minister. He is on his way up in the world of becoming a religious elder. Um, he's, he's looking absolutely great to everybody in the, in the entire parish. Except, of course, because we know his guilt, he himself is aware of the letter A. He and Hester came together and created Pearl. Now, Governor Bellingham is the governor and magistrate of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. We do have to have somebody who is enforcing these laws, the people who are in enforcing the sense of blame, maybe even perhaps a little bit of guilt. We're also going to see a couple more minor characters in the Reverend John Wilson, who is the senior minister of the colony, the person who is technically in charge of Arthur Dimsdale, who Arthur could have gone to and said, look, I had this sin. Um, Hester Prynne is not the only one to blame here. And then we're also going to see Mistress Hibbings, who happens to be Governor Bellingham's sister. She represents a sense of superstition and a sense of fate as well, because people have a tendency to blame her as a witch, and then, of course, wonder whether or not she even has to blame for something else in the colony, something a little more uh, supernatural. So how do these characters tie together? We start off with Hester Prynne, who publicly confessed her adultery, and she wears the scarlet letter as her punishment. She and Arthur had a love affair, and Arthur secretly confessed uh, his adultery, and he punishes himself in private for his sin. He doesn't tell anybody else. However, Roger Chillingworth figures out his secret torment. After all, he and Arthur are living together for quite some time. Uh, Arthur, living with his sin, is becoming more physically weak. Uh, and so, because Roger Chillingworth, now the doctor of the colony, wants to try and cure his ills, one day he comes upon Arthur and finds out. Uh, you'll have to read as to how he does that. But he does represent the theme of revenge, not only against tormenting Arthur uh, Dimsdale, but he also wants to torment his wife, Hester Prynne, because of who she, uh, she has unfortunately created adultery with, he wants to be able to torment the both. And then, of course, Pearl is tied to Hester and Arthur. Um, they are her mother and father. She is the human embodiment of the Scarlet Letter and of her parents' sin. Let's take a look at another uh, part of your element of fiction, the point of view. This, is, uh, sto this story is told in third-person omniscient point of view. Hawthorne reveals the inner and outer workings of the characters and provides social criticism. Uh, we're looking at an entire community and how they treat Hester and how they treat you know, like somebody who has come in like Roger Chillingworth, uh, how they look up to Arthur Dimsdale, even though he has much of the blame. We're going to have some social criticism and a little bit of history and psychology as we watch over the course of the years these characters grow. So let's take a look at the major symbol, the title of the story, The Scarlet Letter. So they get, this, they get to uh, using this scarlet letter after the public shaming and punishment of a young woman, Hester Prynne, uh, in mid-17th century Boston. When she becomes pregnant, everybody believes she'd be guilty of adultery since her husband has been missing for years. Where else could this child have come from? Since she's been separated from him for two years, the baby can't be his. And so they ask her over and over again, who is the father of the child? You don't have to suffer through this alone. And she decides not to tell. 
Therefore the magistrates and ministers order her to wear the scarlet letter A for adultery on the bodice of her dress, so every one can know about her adultery and will remind themselves for the years to come. Now, the scarlet letter itself is a central symbol. It changes meaning for the characters in the novel as Hester's character changes. The A becomes a pathway for redemption for some of the characters as well. So you're going to want to watch the many ways that Hawthorne is going to use the scarlet A as a symbol. After a while, when we take a look at the scarlet letter A, you're going to hear people in the community starting to use it for a word other than adultery. Now, when you start reading the story, there is chapters in the story, but there's a little bit of a prequel. There's a little bit of a prologue ahead of time, and it's called The Custom House. And that's where the narrator brings himself in, that third-person omniscient point of view. So narrators are going to directly address your audience, and they're going to describe their three-year experience working in a custom house in Salem, Massachusetts. In other words, we're hearing from Nathaniel Hawthorne himself. Now, not many ships come to Salem anymore in the 1850s, probably because Boston and other places further south have become bigger ports. And he explains his discovery of a dress in the custom house that bears an embroidered scarlet letter A. It is so finely looked, uh, looked upon um, that he's kind of wondering what that was for. I mean, it, it somebody took some care into creating it. So then he finds manuscripts that went along with this scarlet letter A, and it bears the story of Hester Prynne as documented by a man named Jonathan Pugh. So the narrator decides to take a look at these manuscripts and to write out the narrative of Hester Prynne. He also spends quite a bit of time in the long prequel, the long prologue, describing the interior and exterior of the custom house. I'm assuming because he worked there for three years, he spent quite a bit of time in the house, so he's, he's practicing his description. Uh, Hawthorne also describes the feelings about his native town of Salem. Again, that idea of social criticism that we're going to see throughout the book is also in the custom house. And he makes very critical comments about the Whig Party, and it reveals that Hawthorne himself was a Democrat at the time. And it describes his early attempts to write down Hester's story and the troubles that he had gone through before he made it to his final narrative. Then we actually get to the story of Hester Prynne herself. So we start off with chapter one, The Prison Door, and I just want to give you a little bit of a snippet of what it is to come since this is just the introduction. So The Prison Door obviously is going to set the scene for the action to come and prepares you for the themes uh, with the discussion of a prison and a rosebush, the idea of such beauty and such pain, such drama being put together, such opposites being put together. It's kind of what you're going to see in the entire book. So when we take a look at the theme of human forgiveness, the fact that our major character is starting off in prison, and then when we get into chapter two, the fact that she won't reveal the, the other guilty party's name, starts setting up that theme of human blame and guilt and our human nature, our willingness to forgive. Chapter two is the marketplace. We start getting that stern morality of Puritan society. We start learning about the Puritans. We see Hawthorne's disapproval of the stern women in the crowd, and we introduce the main character through these stern women who want to tell us about her faults. Uh, it immediately begins showing the narrator's sympathy for Hester. She's full of beauty. She's full of grace and pride. Everything that these stern women in the crowd are not. Now, the scaffold is introduced for the first of three times in the book, and it's introduced as a symbol of the public view of things as contrasted as to what is hidden in people's hearts, in particular, the guilty male party of Arthur Dimsdale. Chapter 3 is called The Recognition, and the reader strongly suspects that the deformed stranger who just happened to come on the day of Hester's punishment at the scaffold that stranger is Hester's husband, whom she's been thinking about in the previous chapter. And so suspense is built through the recognition. Hester realizes her husband is there watching, and the reader realizes how the main characters are tied to one another. Then we start developing more characterization as we start getting into the story. The interview, as Roger has claimed himself as a doctor to the town, and they would certainly need a doctor, um, he goes in and decides to talk to Hester for the first time. Hester shows that she fears his nature when she asks, Art thou th like the black man that haunts the forest around us? She can't believe that her husband Roger is not only here alive, 
but is he has he come to seek his revenge? And then now that Hester has been set free in chapter 5, we start seeing Hester settling into the community with Pearl. It's an entirely descriptive chapter which examines Hester's penance for her sin. How is she going to move on with life now that she is uh, Pearl's mother, now that she has to live with the scarlet letter A? So then in chapter 6, we're going to introduce the character of Pearl. Plural, oh, excuse me, Pearl. She has very little plot and no dialogue because, again, at this stage, she's a very small infant child. Now, it does continue on with the idea of chapter 5, which it continues with Hester's penance in relationship to her daughter, because her daughter is a symbol of her sin. Although it is a reminder of the sin like the letter, however, Pearl is a lovely child whose place was on that same dishonored bosom to connect her parent forever with the race and descent of mortals and to finally be a blessed soul in heaven. So in spite of the fact that the scarlet letter A itself is just a sign of pure evil, it's got that red color, um, it's supposed to define to everybody what Hester has done wrong. Pearl is a symbol of the sin, but she's a very beautiful part. She's a lovely child, and she's going to be a blessed soul in heaven. So even though she's a symbol of sin, we also have this sense of goodness in her. Chapter 7, we go to the Governor's Hall. Again, we have to reintroduce the sense of Puritanism and that sense of uh, male-dominant leadership that was there in Puritan society. Hester's A is magnified in the Governor's armor, uh, the armor that has been so carefully polished and set up on display. Um, we don't have mirrors, and we don't have a lot of times where people can actually look at their reflection in early Puritan times. So when Hester can finally see a reflection of herself, there's this young, beautiful woman with this young, beautiful little girl, and all she can see is her A being magnified and enlarged in the armor. Pearl demands a rose from the bush outside, which reminds us of the rose bush outside of the prison. So when Pearl decides, you know, just as a little girl, she'd like a flower, we're reminded again of the sense of beauty and the sense of pain, like such a rose bush would bring. Chapter 8, we are still at the governor's mansion, but now we are bringing our four main characters together for the first time. And we are given hints that Arthur is Pearl's father. The fact that he is extremely interested in how Pearl is growing up, trying to take a look at her to see if he can see anything of himself in her. We don't get a direct common link, but we start giving hints. We also see the physical appearances mirroring the psychological or spiritual states, where we have a very strong Pearl and a very strong Hester, uh, still representing the idea of beauty and sin. Arthur is becoming weaker. Pearl also is becoming a little bit more impish, a little bit more supernatural-like. And Roger is becoming more misshapen and even uglier and darker than he was previously. So then we continue into The Leech in Chapter 9, in which we continue with Roger Chillingworth and start wondering as to why he has taken upon this change. So we're developing more fully what was hinted at the previous chapter. And then as we bring in uh, The Leech and his patient in Chapter 10, we start seeing together the idea of our four characters. So in Chapter 10, we're reminded that Roger's also always been kind and upright. And he reminds Hester of that, and Hester says yes. She, she remembers him in Europe as a kind, upstanding man. So that is going to emphasize our theme of revenge, how revenge has contributed to Roger's decline. And Pearl is, is starting to show more supernatural because she sees a little bit of insight. She sees Roger as the black man. She sees him as an evildoer. She has no reason or cause to think that the doctor is linked anyway to her mother. She has no link or cause as to why she would think he's evil. Uh, but she she's known to have insight here. She sees that he is there's something wrong with him. And at the end of the chapter, Roger makes some kind of discovery for his patient and Arthur. So now that we're starting to look a little bit more at Arthur Dimsdale in chapters 11 and 12, Roger becomes certain of Arthur's guilt by the end of chapter 10, and so he starts intensifying his cruelty towards him in chapter 11. Now, it's ironic that Arthur's attempt at public confession uh, up on the scaffold only intensifies 
his parishioners love for him. Now, he has a tendency to talk a lot about guilt and how he himself is just only human, that he sins himself, uh, and he doesn't come out and specifically say what sin he has created. So, of course, the parishioners think, well, what, what a lovely gentleman that he wants to think that he's just as wrong as us. And so it just intensifies parishioners' love for him. In the Minister's Vigil in Chapter 12, it's the second of the three scaffold scenes where it brings all four of the characters again together. We have an interesting nighttime vision where there happens to be a lot of light in the sky, even though it is as dark as night outside. So you kind of wonder, what is the me real meaning here if you have an extremely dark night and all of a sudden we have the stars and probably even a meteor shooting across the sky? And Arthur's subconsciousness, he doesn't go willingly to the scaffold. He almost sleepwalks there. He can't sleep. And so as he starts wandering outside at night to take a walk, it's like he's almost led himself to the scaffold as if he feels he needs to stand there. And he barely resists his impulses. He almost wants to shriek out. He wants people to wake up and to come out to the scaffolding and see him there. But he doesn't do that. And so when we continue on into chapter 13 and 14, we go back to the character of Hester. Now we've moved a little bit more in time, so Pearl's become older. Hester has as well, and she's starting to fade with her beauty, not so much from the age, so much as she has decided she wants to hide her youth and her beauty. State, so chapter 13 is going to state the changes that have occurred in Hester over time. And it also kind of helps the way the community sees her. Yes, she still wears her scarlet letter A. Yes, the community is still well aware she's committed this, this crime of adultery. But the community is beginning to change its thoughts towards Hester in a more positive light. In chapter 14, we once again put Hester and Roger together. And we do finally see a bit more sympathy towards Roger, that he still has the potential of being a good man. Hester herself reminds him what a good man he used to be and tells him to continue on, that he should, as a good, work, as a good worker, as a doctor, he should you know, find himself the goodness in him once again. And, of course, he can't do so. He's so stuck on his revenge with Arthur Dimsdale that he tells Hester that he just, he simply cannot. So at the end of the chapter, he shows his admiration and his sympathy for Hester. At least you can overcome your sin, he tells Hester. He himself, at least in chapter 14, cannot. In chapter 15, we're exploring Hester and Pearl's relationship. Um, here we're looking a little negative at Hester because of her expressed hatred for Roger. And she also has been lying to Pearl. Pearl wants to know who this black man is. And Roger, she wants to know more about Arthur Dimsdale. She wants to know her. I mean, she's becoming old enough that she is able to start asking questions. Why do they live alone? Why do the kids treat her different? And Hester is trying her best to try and keep all of this pain and sadness away from Pearl. And so white lies are becoming in chapter 15. Chapter 16 in the Forest Walk, there's a ton of symbolism in here. Hawthorne is great as a symbolic author from his time period that he writes in anyway, but if you're looking for symbolism, I would start in chapter 16. We see as we're taking a forest walk, the rays of sunshine that kind of spill in through the trees. Pearl walks into them, she's dancing in the sunshine, and as soon as Hester reaches out her hand to put it in the sunshine, the rays of sunshine disappear. We also see Pearl resembling the brook that they decide to sit nearby and rest. How even unlike the brook, she is sparkling because, as Pearl says, she wears nothing on her bosom yet. She is still free and clear and able to roam and move like the brook, unlike her mother, because she wears nothing on her bosom yet. So as long as we're going to continue with the symbolism and stay in the woods, we have the pastor and his parishioner. This is the first time we see Arthur and Hester alone. Pearl is nearby, but she's playing in the brook. So this is the first chapter that we actually get a little bit of a love story. It's the first time Arthur and Hester are alone together in so many years. And it actually shows the depth of Hester's feelings for Arthur. She is in love with this man. And he seems to be returning the same feelings. In chapter 18, 
The flood of sunshine finally finds Hester, and so the setting of the forest plays an important role, representing this oasis of freedom. As soon as the sun starts shining in on them, she lets down her hair, she takes off her cap, uh, she throws off her letter for the very first time. She takes the letter off, and she literally throws it from her. Hester, Arthur, and Pearl then plan to follow natural laws instead of the laws of mankind. They've decided that they are going to become a family. Now, Hester takes control here and decides that they will all leave, uh, and they start making plans in order for them to become a family someday. There is, however, a weird relationship between Pearl and Arthur. He seems to have a bit of reluctance toward her, like he doesn't know how he should act in a child's uh, sight. Um, and as Hester is trying to tell Pearl, you need to come and tell this man how much you love him, give him a kiss, she starts asking her mother, why? When we go back into town, will he act the same way? And when we find out, no, he will not, Pearl doesn't want to have anything to do with this man. After all... He's getting in the way of her relationship with Hester, and she doesn't like it. In Chapter 19, The Child at the Brookside, we see Pearl's behavior is being focused at her being upset with the changes in Hester. She doesn't like that her mother is no longer wearing the A. She doesn't like her mother's hair down. She looks extremely different, and Pearl doesn't like this. And so when she finally gets Arthur's kiss put upon her, she goes down to the brook, and she wipes it off. In chapter 20, as we start seeing them going back into town, uh, Hester lives on the edge of town, so she doesn't have to deal with the population, but the minister needs to go back into the town and resume his duties until they can leave. And so we can see the effects of Arthur's subconsciousness, the fact that he feels he now has an out. He can actually live. And so when we see that, we also see his sinful nature to the world. He's wondering if he's going to get away with his sin, and so he sees the sin everywhere. Before we leave, the next time a boat is going to leave, though, is after the New England holiday. And so we actually stop the entire story in order for Hawthorne to remind us again about Puritan society and gives the historical background of Election Day in Puritan society. So then in chapter 22, we pick the plot line back up and we actually start discussing the New England holiday itself, the Election Day holiday. And it revolves around Arthur Dimsdale. Since he is one of the elders, he's supposed to give the Election Day speech. It's going to be one of his greatest sermons yet. And the other three main characters are waiting to see how he handles this particular conflict, how he is supposed to be the absolute epitome of religion and the Puritan society and yet he also is ready to leave it all behind. So in chapter 23, after his election sermon is done, he walks almost directly to the scaffolding scene. We have our third and final scaffold scene, and this is the novel's climax of the play, where he actually reveals his letter A that he has had upon him all this time. And after that, since he was in such a weakened state from whether himself or if Roger has helped him along to this weak state, he is about to die. And as he falls down and is at near death, Pearl decides to kiss Arthur for the first time before he dies. It's almost like as if she finally claims, this is my father and I love you. Chapter 24 is the conclusion of our novel, The Denouement. And so we get the fates of the remaining characters. Now that Arthur is passed on, what happens to Hester and Pearl? Now that Roger Chillingworth no longer has to enact revenge, what happens to Roger? And kind of what happens to the Puritan society? What did they think about Arthur's death and how did they still treat Hester afterwards? So it philosophizes a little bit on your themes and the lessons to be learned. That is the end of our chapters. I'm glad you came along the ride for, uh, for our, our slide selection of the introduction of The Scarlet Letter. If you like what you saw, please let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear more about The Scarlet Letter or about other novels. Uh, and if you liked the channel, please, I'd love it if you would subscribe. Thanks for stopping by.